So 2016 was a much better year for the oil market and actually OPEC, well, they, they came to a decision at last. So let's discuss that and what will feature in 2017 right now with Richard Mallinson from Energy Aspects. Hello to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. So in the end, OPEC, they agreed to something. Absolutely. I mean, they're disappointed in Doha in April. They kept us waiting a long time, but right at the end of the year, they came out with a deal. And I think it was a deal that came at a time when a lot of the market had begun to write off the possibility of OPEC acting. Mm -hmm. And also it was a deal that was a lot more specific and concrete than many in the market were expecting. We'd always said, don't write off the chances of this. But the fact that they gave individual quotas, the fact they had Iran and Iraq on board promising to comply, you know, all of these were things that the market should be looking at to say there's an increased chance this is going to work. And 2017, do you think that we'll see the results of this agreement? I really do. I don't think we're going to see 100% compliance. There will be a little bit of cheating at the margins. But what we're going to see, because OPEC is going to cut its production and because several non-OPEC producers are going to join them over the first half of the year, is instead of stocks continuing to build, extending that oversupply, we should see stocks drawing from the start of next year. And that's really significant in terms of the direction for the market and the direction for prices. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about prices, because it's loitering at about $53 a barrel at the moment. Now, we know what that means. It means that production then gets ramped up, and then you get this vicious circle situation. To an extent, I think we've got to separate out here US producers. At these prices, they are bringing more rigs back. They are going to increase activity in the most productive basins, places like the Permian. There's other areas like the Eaglefoot. They don't work very well at these prices. But outside of the US, this is still too low. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see a ramp up in activity in the North Sea. You're not going to see a lot more activity in deep water basins around the world. And so the US production can grow next year, but we think the rest of the world declines and those declines are larger than the growth in the US. But what does that do to competition? So Saudi Arabia versus the US, for example, because there is an argument that Saudi Arabia was trying to um, destroy the shale industry. What does that do for the global situation? Well, I've never really bought that argument. I think the Saudis did realise um, early on, and even if they didn't, they realise now, shale isn't an industry you can just kill off with a period of low prices. There's mm -hmm. too many companies, there's too many opportunities to gain efficiency. But what they have done is really reduce investment in the global upstream, reduce investment in these high cost five, seven, ten year projects. Those just aren't happening. We've got over six million barrels a day of production that was expected to be developed, which is no longer happening because of low prices. It's on hold or it's been cancelled entirely. That's a success for Saudi Arabia. It creates more space for them to sell their production into. And remember, global demand is still growing. For all the talk of electric cars, for all of the kind of concerns about the state of the global economy, grown by over a million barrels a day this year, it'll grow by over a million barrels a day next year. The question is, who gains that incremental market share, not how do you fight to hold on in a declining market yet? Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, actually, as you say, with demand, because that's been a big feature that often people forget about, especially from the likes of China. What happens, though, if that decline does falter? Because actually, as I say, that's been the one kind of shining light in this whole oversupply glut situation. Well, I think it has been really important. You know, 2015 was an excellent year for global demand. 2016 was strong, stronger than many expected at the start of the year, not as good. I think 2017 is looking pretty good, particularly if we have a cold winter now. Mm -hmm. Really, the baton has passed from China, uh, where the economy, you know, growth is still happening, but more slowly, it's less intensive in terms of the sort of manufacturing industry. It's passing to India where fantastic things are happening in terms of oil demand growth. It's passing to smaller economies, and it's passed even to places like the US, where lower oil prices have really boosted driving, they've boosted flying. Now, as prices start to increase, we will see some of that slow down, but I think a lot of it is structural. It's about expanding populations, rising income levels. I think that is going to prove resilient unless we go right back up into the kind of prices we saw three, four years ago. Okay, and let's just concentrate um, in conclusion on the prices then. Um, you say they're gonna gain, by how much? What are we talking here? Well, I think the next few months, um, it is gonna be a bit of a waiting game. The market's moved up on anticipation that OPEC will act. Now it needs to see the proof of that action. It needs to see how much 
effect that has. But once we start to see those stock draws, once we see lower volumes coming out of OPEC, so February, March time, I think we can definitely see prices move into the 60s, uh, low 60s at first for Brent. If we get into the second half of the year and the rebalancing is firmly underway, then I think we can be looking into the 70s. We can see uh, this curve move into backwardation, but that's only going to really happen sustainably at the end of next year, I think. Oh, wow. OK, Richard, thank you very much indeed. We'll leave it there. Thank you for your time. That's Richard Mallinson there, there, talking about OPEC and the price of oil in 2017.